want you to take your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 5, if you would please. I want to start out there. Appreciate everybody being here. When I get to heaven, I'll know everything. Sometimes down here, I don't know. Sometimes we have a Sunday morning service, and boy, it just seems like there's a, there's a high spirit in the service. And the people, you can hear it singing, you can sense it in one another. And uh, sometimes there isn't. And I don't think it's necessarily that we need God to move us into a high spirit or what I would, I would say maybe a joyful spirit or something like that. I think God has his way every time we get together and we meet him. Sometimes God wants us lifted up. Sometimes God wants us sober. And so I've learned to try not to push against that. Try not to generate something that God doesn't want generated. There's, uh, there's some churches, I guess, that they've got the idea that if they have church, they ought to kick and dance and spin around three times and everything like that. And uh, that's part of our flesh, and God don't like our flesh getting involved in worship. Amen? Sometimes it's best if we're a little bit more on the reserved, quiet side than anything. And this morning, I'm going to preach something that is going to be heavy, and it's... To be honest with you, I hope it makes us all uncomfortable because we need that every now and then. I believe that the Bible and running to God is a place of comfort. It should be a place of joy. Uh, but there are things that we have done in life that don't deserve a lot of comfort and joy. Amen? So, God laid it on my heart a few weeks ago to preach on lying. And um, I asked then, I asked last Sunday, some of the reasons why people, number one, will tell lies, and number two, why people will believe a lie, willingly want to believe a lie. Um, I told you to turn to Matthew 5, that was in error. Turn to 1 Timothy 4. I had the wrong note pulled up. 1 Timothy 4. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the scriptures. I'm going to give you some comments on it. I don't, I'm not going to try to get a lot of amens out of you. I'm going to let you just listen. And, um, and if you want to say amen, say amen. If you want to get up and shout, get up and shout. If you... If God really leads you to get up and tell everybody in this church every vile thing you've done in the last 7 to 14 days, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to stop you, but I think you ought to be careful. Amen. God could have set it to where anytime any of us did something wrong, he could have put it in the scriptures that any time we did something wrong, we had to come before the church and tell everybody everything we did and have the church forgive us before we could go to heaven. God could have done that. But I want you to remember even how Jesus taught us to handle sin among church members. Sin among church members. Jesus said if a, if a brother or a sister offends that one is to go to them and do so in a spirit of meekness with the intent to restore them, to bring them back into full fellowship. And let's be honest, if somebody says something to you or does something to you and it offends you, we can pretend, but we're not in close fellowship with that person. Because our feelings, I mean, it's hard to get over something like that. I mean, after a while, time heals all wounds, I guess. But it's just hard to do that. And, uh, but when, if we go to somebody with the intention of restoring them, once that sin has been laid out, once it's been forgiven, I mean, it's, it's over with after that. It's been dealt with, it's been forgiven, it's been confessed, it's been forgiven. And the person 
who goes to the person who sinned needs to remember that you're the same kind of sinner and that somebody might have to come to you one of these days. Or somebody has come to you and don't forget how you felt when somebody had to confront you about something you did. But then the Bible says that if, if that person who sins, they don't listen to that, then he's to come back with a second witness. Because what God's doing is God reveals it a little bit at a time. Now, if you want it kept hidden from everybody's sight, best thing to do at the beginning is confess it, move on. Some people don't want to do that. So bring somebody else along. Now there's two people going to know about it. And still the idea is with, um, you know, restoration, bringing them back to fellowship. But then by the time the third deal comes around, third deal is they stand, have to stand before the church. Even if they don't want to, that church, is gonna, that church has to know what they did. And then it has to be reported to the church that they either, they either uh, confessed or they're not willing to confess, but we have the evidence, we know it happened. In fact, it was all, it was all over social media. It was all over Facebook. It ended up on YouTube. And this is what they did. We gave them the opportunity to come and confess and we were going to forgive them and re restore them, but they decided not to come. They decided to fight it. They decided they weren't going to be a part of it. I talked to a pastor about that, and he said that on, on a couple different occasions, it's actually come to him bringing it before the church, and he said, I've never had the person actually show up for that meeting. Usually by the time it gets there, they're long gone, and they ain't coming back. But the church has to know, and I mean, who is it among us that really wants everybody knowing about all their, their nasty sins? Nobody does. Nobody does. And so, I want you to think about that, about the reason why we, A, we lie, B, we believe lies. And uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, the Bible says this, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. The word press is in there. I'm trying to get it into us. That in the latter times, I believe we're in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, the faith, there's one faith only, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. In verse 2, look at that verse. Look at what does it say? Speaking lies in what? Hypocrisy. Somebody give me a definition of hypocrisy. What do you think that means? Uh, fake? Sure. Right. So what is, what is a hypocrite? Okay, they pretend, let's say in the church context, they pretend that they're super Christian here in the building, and then before they ever leave the parking lot, they're everything else but that, right? Okay, um, so you know what's best to do, right? Don't pretend to be super Christian here. Just, just know that you're forgiven. Don't put off some kind of big show here in the house of God because outside of this place, everybody else knows what you're doing. But they're speaking lies in hypocrisy. Then, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, my two days I worked at McDonald's restaurants, I learned how to sear a hamburger. It's all I learned, but I learned how to sear a hamburger. Back then, before they had the press, they had the grill... And we had this big handheld deal when we laid the frozen patties down. I was supposed to take the thing and swirl three times on each burger. And that was pressing that meat down onto that hot grill, that hot iron grill. And what it did is it took all them juices and fat and blood on the surface of that burger and made a big crust right on the surface of the burger and that sealed in. They call it the juices, it's fat. Grease. Amen. Do it over, turn it over, do the same thing. When something, when your conscience is seared with a hot iron, what that means is you can live a lie in front of everybody and get away with it, and nobody knows. Nobody knows. And when you're, when you're called to question on it, when you get pulled over by the cops, you don't even shake. 
when they show up. You, you are a smooth tomato in front of them. You can lie. You got any drugs in the car? Man, I don't even do drugs. And you got a whole trunk full of marijuana. Okay? And they're reading you, and they're going, well, I'm reading him. He doesn't seem to be lying, so he can move on. There are people in this world who are like that. Okay? Unfortunately, those are not the ones that get pulled over with, what was it, 301 pounds of marijuana in their car. Did you see that the other day? If you're driving with marijuana in your car, make sure all your taillights work. Okay? Let's see, cops, cops are trained to read people's body language. They're trained to look right about here to see if their heart throbbing out, out of their skin. That tells them their conscience is witnessing to the outside world saying, I know I got a bunch of stuff in here I shouldn't have. And you can lie all you want to, but your conscience is telling. But some people, listen to me, they get their conscience here with a hot iron. You don't ever want that. You don't ever want that. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Let me read this to you, and then we're going to go to our next verse. Proverbs 10, 18. He that hideth hatred with lying lips, and he that uttereth slander is a fool. But notice how it's framed. He hideth hatred with lying lips. In other words, I really hate you, but I'm going to hide it very well behind my lying lips. What, you know what I'm doing is that I've got, I've got a sin against you, but I don't want you to find out about it, so I'm going to cover up that sin with, boy, I love you. Boy, I thank God for you. Oh, man, I, I just love being around you. See, believe it or not, there are people who do that, and, let's be honest, we like hearing stuff like that from people. You may feel that somebody's got it out for you, but when they come to you and start uh, just <laughs> lathering it on, oh man, you're great, oh I love you. Well, maybe I was wrong about that person. And we would rather believe that they like us or love us rather than they hate us and so we'd rather believe the lie than believe the truth. But then the truth always comes out. And we'll say this at the beginning, then we're going to pray. Be sure your sin will find you out. Be sure it will. You can only hide it for so long. And then God's going to come to you privately. Like Jesus went to Nicodemus privately. Then if that don't work, God's going to bring somebody else. And God's going to let other people know about it privately. And if that don't work, God's going to tell everybody who you are. Let's go to the Lord and pray. And let's ask God to pray, ask God to bless and help us to... We need this message. We need it. My question is, this morning... Is there sin in somebody's life, in somebody's heart today? Is there unconfessed, unrepented of, continual sin in somebody's life? And you're lying about it. You're lying, it, you're lying about it to cover it up. Father, our hearts are desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. That's what your Bible says. And God, I just... I don't like saying things like this, Father. God, I've been really bothered lately. And you know why. Lord, I just don't want to say certain things to anybody anymore. It, it's almost like it just doesn't really accomplish much. But Father, it's your word. And you asked me to say it, so I have to say it. I pray, Lord, that you'd bless it. And God, I have it in my heart, my mind, that your real saints and your real people, God, would want to hear the truth and know the truth. Not want to live in lies. Not want to just live in the deceitfulness of their own mind, their own heart. 
But Father, we lie to cover up our sins and we, and we believe lies to continue in our sins. That's how wicked our heart is. And God, that's going to keep a lot of people out of heaven. It's going to, it's going to send a lot of people a lot of church people are going to be in the lake of fire forever because they love to tell a lie to cover up sins and they believe lies to continue in sins. God help us here at Bethel Church and help those that are listening online. Father, you've taught me over and over and over again. My flesh is still my wicked flesh, God, and I make no apologies for it, but God, you've taught me many times, Mike, just tell the truth. And God, I didn't want to. I did not, I did not want to tell the truth. Because I knew, Lord, what it would do. But it was my fault. So, Father, help me preach this message in love and not, not demanding anything from anybody that I'm not willing to do myself. And God, just bless and honor your word. We need it. We need it. This world needs the truth. And they're not, they're not going to get it, God. They're not going to get it off the Internet. They're not going to get it from the cults. They're not going to get it from the from the big mainstream churches. God, they're going to get it from your people. And if they can't get it from us, they're just not going to get it. And Father, if we don't tell the truth, you'll pick somebody that will. So God, I'd rather it be us, and you use us, and you be glorified in us and through us. But Father, help us, dear God, to deal in honesty. Bless your word, I pray, Lord. Help me to preach this message, I pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Now turn in your Bible to um, Genesis chapter 3. I tried to link my uh, tablet up with the projector this morning, and just it's like me sometimes, it just wasn't working. Some days I get up, you know how you have those, you have those days you just don't work. And so today it just wasn't working. I don't know what the reason was. So I'm going to make you open your Bible up. How's that? We're all using the King James. Amen? Amen. All right. Now Genesis chapter 3. And I want you to look first. Listen now. This is why I'm preaching this message. Whenever we do something wrong, you listen to me. Our first instinct, our first instinctive reaction to our own sin is covered up. That is our, that our, our first instinctive reaction is not confess it openly. That is not our first response to things we do wrong. Our first response to what we do wrong is to cover it up. Look at Adam and Eve. Genesis 3, verse 7. The eyes of them both were open. They had just eaten that fruit. And they knew that they were naked. You know what God's showing by that? There's nothing hidden from me. God, you're not hiding anything from a God who sees you naked. You can cover up everything you want from everybody else, but God sees you naked. God sees everything about you. He knows everything you did. So my question is, why hide it from God? I mean, yeah, I mean, I can understand hiding some things from some people, but why hide them from God? All he wants to do is forgive you. Now, he may want to whoop you. That's not so bad, is it? That's better than going to hell. A whipping from God or an everlasting lake of fire. Hmm, I'll take the whipping. That's what David did. God said, David, I'll give you a choice. I, I, you can either be put in my hands or the hands of men. And David said, God, you're merciful. I don't trust men. So David picked it right. And when Nathan came to David to confront him about his sin with Bathsheba, David said, I did it. I did it. So, but their first, now their eyes are open. Now they're naked. And now watch this. See, this is an awareness that God knows what you did. And here comes the Holy Ghost. The purpose of the Holy Spirit of God 
to go with us every day throughout our lives is to constantly tell us that was wrong or to say before we do it, don't do it, that's wrong, that's wrong, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Oh, you did it. That was wrong. That what you did was wrong. I'm, God knows about it. I know about it. Now your family's going to know about it. Everybody in your neighborhood's going to know about it. The internet's going to know about it. That's what the Holy Ghost is trying to get us to. What he's trying to do to us is to awaken us to our sin. So that we can confess it and move on. Because that's what God wants. He wants us to move on from it. Amen. Get, leave it behind. Let it go. Let, leave all these things behind, Paul said. Let's press toward the mark. So now they have this awareness that God knows what they did. Now they know they're naked. So look at what they did. Immediately they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Let's cover this up. Let's cover this up. Let's hide this so that nobody sees that we did anything wrong. And all that cover is, is you lying about it. It's you lying about what you did wrong. And let's just, let's just, Throw it out there and let's just get honest. You lied to your parents, didn't you? You lied to them. What would you say, John? Get out. <laughs> Lord, he's not like the rest of us. No, we all did, amen? Amen. We lied to our parents. Most of the time, they knew what we did. They were just waiting for us to come out with it. But we kept lying. Because we figured if we keep up the lies and keep being adamant about the lies, then maybe they'll believe us. And we, here we are, sweat running down our head, tears running down our eyes. We're dancing and fidgeting, and we won't look them in the eyes. And they know, but we're still insisting that we didn't do it. Okay? But they knew. But there are some things that not even your mom and dad knew. That's because they figured, well, he'll tell me the truth on this, and you lied to him about it, and they went on thinking that you didn't do anything wrong, and they were, they were happy about that. I had... I, listen, dealing with, with had, we had a Christian school here dealing with parents. We had one young, young lady that was caught cheating. And I just, I thought, you know what? I know the little politics that goes on with her and her mom. So I said, write down in your words everything that you did today that you got in trouble for. And she wrote it down in her own words. And I had that piece of paper on my desk. And that evening, sure enough, the mom called. My daughter said that she got in trouble for something she didn't do. I said, well, what did she tell you she did? She came up with some story. I said, well, let me read this piece of paper to you. And I said, this is what your daughter wrote and signed her name to it, and I can show it to you next time you come to church. She came to church here, and I read it to her. She said, Megan, you are so in trouble. I probably shouldn't have told the name, but anyway, you don't know them, okay? Whoops. Okay? They're long gone from here. But anyway, that's what happened. I knew she was going to lie. I knew she was going to lie. And she did. Why did she lie? Cover up. There's two ways of dealing with your sins. Confess or cover. Cover. Confession will get you heaven. Covering up will get you lake of fire for all of eternity. It's your choice. They made themselves aprons, and then they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife, look at this. Now they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. How, how does that work? How does that work? Where you can think you can hide from the presence of Almighty God who can see everything. 
He sees and knows everything. He sees what you did. He sees how you tried to cover it up. He knows everything. And yet Adam and Eve tried to hide themselves from the presence of God. And that's what we do. That's... Here's God. So when we sin and don't confess it, what's the first thing we do? Hide ourselves from the presence of God. We don't want God near us. Meaning, we don't read our Bible because we don't want to hear it. We don't want to know it. We don't want God to find out. Listen, the eyes of the Lord are right here. And you're reading this Bible and all of a sudden, you're reading the very verse of what you did wrong. And the Holy Ghost is saying, read that. Now read it again. Read it again. And you even try to close your Bible and say, well, I'm just, I'm going to open up some other place. And then lo and behold, another place in the Bible says the same thing you did. I'm just telling you, you hide from God. So you stop reading your Bible, you quit praying, all of a sudden you start laying out of church. Why? Am I right on this? Am I just making this stuff up? Listen, I know us sinners. I'm one of them. I know the games that we play between us and other people, between us and our family members, between us and God. So they hid from God. Verse 9, and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told, who told thee that thou was naked? God is confronting Adam. Adam, how did you learn this piece of information? Where did this come from that you're naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree where have I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? You know what? Every action of Adam is showing his conscience. And remember what your conscience is. You remember what that is? Con means with, science means you know it. You were present and aware of what you did when you did it. You didn't do it sleepwalking, did you? Okay? You weren't out so drunk that you don't remember. Well, that might have been partly true. But you're the one who got yourself drunk, right? So you know what you did, and everything about Adam and Eve is their conscience driving them to do what they did and their first instinct is to cover up their own sin turn your bible to isaiah 28 isaiah 28 and you gotta remember something i'm looking around i don't i don't see our church pews filled with lost sinners eager to repent and be saved. I'm looking at church members. And on the other side of that camera, there are people who align themselves with us. And you're just as guilty as everybody else here is. So I'm preaching to God's people. Things that we ought to know, but we still do wrong. I said 28, 14. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Because ye have said, we've made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. Now, notice this next passage here. For we have made lies our what? Refuge. And under falsehood have we hid ourselves. And I, I tell you what, I read that verse years ago. It has stuck with me ever since. We had a situation years ago when we had a daycare. We had a little girl, little baby, that all of a sudden it turned out she had a, she had a, a broken ankle. And nobody knew how it happened. But it happened here at the daycare. And so I brought up the teacher or the daycare worker that was responsible for her. And my immediate instinct was, whatever, whatever happened, here's what I want you to tell them. I'm not kidding you. I sat in my office struggling, wanting to lie to the investigators when they came. And I sat for a long time with my mouth shut 
because God wasn't going to let me say it. And finally, I mean, I prayed and I'm bawling. I'm saying, God, please. And I looked at the worker and I said, to the best of your recollection, tell me what happened. And she told me that she said the best thing she knows, remembers that she set her down in the chair or something like that and her leg got twisted in there or something like that. It was accidental. And because the baby didn't cry immediately, didn't know anything had happened. And even after hearing that, I'm going, boy, that could still come back on us. But, and God, it's the whole time, I'm remembering this verse, Mike, don't, let, don't make lies your refuge, don't make lies your refuge, don't make lies your refuge. I wanted to retreat under a lie and hide under a lie. And I said, here's what I'm telling you to do. When they come, answer their questions. And what they ask you, you tell them the truth. And that exact thing happened. The investigator said, yeah, we see this happen from time to time. It happens. We have no reason to believe that anything malicious happened here. Everything's okay. <sighs> but it was, I fought my flesh so hard on this. I'm just giving you one example. Out of a lifetime of wanting to lie to cover up my own sin or to cover up somebody else's for the sake of this church or whatever. I just keep having that verse go through my mind all the time. Make lies, we have made lies our refuge. We made lies our refuge. And what we do is we like to, when we, when we get faced, when we get confronted, we like to run and duck under, I didn't do that, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. That ain't mine. That wasn't me. I didn't say that. Under falsehood, we've hid ourselves. What you're doing, you are robbing God. Because, um, turn to Psalm 32. I want to give you a better deal. Psalm 32. I'm going to give you a far better deal. Psalm 32, verse 1. Blessed, the word blessed, if God blesses you, you, that's a saved word. If God blesses you, you're saved. Amen? God blesses you, you're lost, you're going to hell. So blessed is he whose transgression is what? God won't forgive it until you confess it. You try to hide it, you try to cover it up, you try to make lies your refuge, God will not forgive you. Because you did what Saul did. Saul went against the word of the Lord, he disobeyed the word of the Lord. Then when Samuel came and confronted him with it, you know what Saul did? Samuel said, you did not keep the word of the Lord. Saul said, I did too. I did too. He tried to cover it up, his own transgressions, and tried to justify his deeds. He made lies his refuge. He went and hid under falsehood. And because of that, that one thing, that you think you can't go to hell for one thing, Saul's there. That one thing that he did was he made lies his refuge. He tried to cover his own sin by lying about it, just like David did. Just like David did. David knew all about that, didn't he? And God rejected Saul and quit having mercy on him right then and there. Oh, you don't want my forgiveness? Fine, I won't give it to you the rest of your life. How's that? And the Bible said God took his spirit away from Saul and evil spirit from the Lord came on Saul. And Saul hated the Bible. You know who the Bible was to Saul? It was Samuel and it was David. And every time he saw David, he wanted to throw a javelin at him and kill him because he reminded him of the Holy Ghost and the word of God that had left him. And he despised it. And there's a lot of people out there, you know, I, I, I'm sorry for, to all the lost people out in the world. I'm sorry if church people made you sour, but I am going to tell you something. Probably at one point, God's man tried to confront you or God's spirit tried to confront you about your sin 
and you lied to the Holy Ghost and God turned his back on you. And that's why some people are not in church to this day. They made lies their refuge and God said, oh, you don't want my salvation, you don't want my mercy, you don't want my forgiveness? Fine, I won't give it. They made lies their refuge. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Covered by God himself. It is said in scripture, what you try to hide, God will reveal. Am I right? What you try to conceal, God will reveal it. God will reveal it to everybody. God will let everybody know it. But let me ask you this question. I want you to raise your hand if, you, if the answer is yes on this. There are things that you've done, terrible things that you've done, that God could have exposed you to everybody. He forgave you, and to this day, nobody knows about it. Now you're always going. But let me tell you something. If God covers it, all the devils of hell cannot pry it open. It's because it was covered with the blood of the Lamb. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputes not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no what? What is guile? Guile is a lie. Remember what Eve said? The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. He lied to me, so I did eat. Guile... If your spirit has guile in it, you're going to try to lie about everything you do. And you're going to want to believe a lie. So, why do sodomites go to certain churches and stay sodomites? Why is that? It's because they know at that church, they're not going to say anything about being a sodomite. Why do fornicators all go to these churches and stay that way? It's because they know that they can go to that church, fornicate, and it'd be okay. So not only do they not want to confess their sin, they want to believe the lie that it's not a sin. Why do all the beer hall people, the beer hall church members, all go to these churches? It's because their church isn't going to say a word about them going to beer halls. And having a, a, a garage refrigerator full of whiskey. Do you keep whiskey in the fridge? No? Okay. Hey, everybody in this church knows one thing about some kind of sin. So, so let's not all get together and say it. Amen. <laughs> there are sins. That to this day, I wish I'd never done. But I'm glad that my father came to me privately. He said, Mike, I need to deal with you about something. I'm glad he was not afraid to do that. Is there sin in this church? I don't know. I would, I would guess and say, probably. Unconfessed sin, unrepented of sin, is sin that you lied about to hide. Whether you lied to somebody, or you lied to yourself, or you lied to God. But you lied to hide. And you know what? I hope that it's still bothering you. I hope it is. Because as long as it's still bothering you, that means you've got a conscience, that means God's dealing with you, and there's hope. What you don't want is to get away with this one and then think you got away with it because you'll do it again. Only you'll do worse. You'll do far worse. And the worse you get, the more you're going to slosh it over. And you're going to try to hide and cover your own sin. All of a sudden now, 
your conscience hard as a rock nothing gets in and then you start doing this stuff and you don't feel guilty about it anymore that's dangerous very dangerous which 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 you think God favors the most and this and I don't know if I know the answer to this question the church member who doesn't do much at all in the way of wrong or the one who does a lot and yet is always open and honest to God about it I'd say I'd say probably this close to being the same here's what I'm gonna ask you to do today I'm gonna ask you to bow your head It's, it's one of these sermons I'm having to look down the aisle a lot because I don't want to be making eye contact with anybody. I don't want you thinking I know something on you. Here's what I know about you. I know you're a sinner. And I know you got ways in you. I w I'm not kidding you. I think within every one of us here in this church building, right here in this room, I think we've got all the sins covered. I think each one of us knows one thing about one sin in this world to our shame. Because I, I just know church people. I grew up in church. I know them. And so for you to try to hide it and act like you didn't do it or act like well, if I didn't get caught, then it's no big deal. God caught you, and it's a big deal with God. You don't got to worry about what I say about you. You got to worry about what God's saying. And I'm just going to ask you this morning, head bowed, eye closed, everybody at home, you're looking down, looking down, keep your head bowed. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, not going to ask you to do anything. I'm just going to ask you right there where you are, right there, right now, Tell God what you did. Tell Him what you did. Tell Him what you've been doing. And ask Him to help you stop. Because it only gets worse. After, to, after, this, after you heard this, it's going to be far worse. That much I know. Because you got the Holy Ghost came to you today while you're listening to this. The Holy Ghost sat down next to you, tapped you on the shoulder and say, let's me and you, we know what this is about, don't we? You think pastor knows? Oh, well, maybe he knows, maybe he doesn't. But I know it. And I think today's the day we're going to take care of it. And if not, then for sure, somebody you don't want to know is going to know. Be sure your sin will find you out. Don't make lies your refuge, people. Don't do it. Don't hide under falsehood. That's going to melt away like snow in the sun one of these days. And everything you've done is going to be done openly in front of everybody. You don't want that. I don't want that for you. So get it out now. And ask God to help you stop it. Father, thank you for the quiet and the stillness, Lord, that your spirit has brought to this room at this time. Thank you, God, Lord, for dealing with hearts. These are the people, Lord, that I love. I would not, Lord, for in a million years, for a million dollars, I would not go to any of them to try to accuse them of something. God, I don't want that between us. I don't want that kind of relationship with them. I want to be their friends. I want to be their brothers. Lord, I want, to be their, I want to be a helper to them. I want to be their pastor. So God, just help everybody, Lord, to understand that it's just not good to hide it. Confess it. Get it out. Ask God for help. But don't try to hide it yourself. You do no good. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would do with this message 
all the things, God, that I cannot do. Do it in my life first. My life first. Then do it for my family next. My family. My daughters, my sons, my grandchildren. Their spouses. God, do it for all of them. Do it for my wife. And then, Father, these good people in this church, help us, dear God, to not hide under falsehoods and lies, but to lay out and be open before you and in your sight and in your presence, God, and confessing our sins, repenting of our sins, begging you, Lord, for mercy, and begging you for help to never do it again. Father, Lord, just give some relieved hearts today their conscience now being purified in that while they know they sin, they also know that they are forgiven. And God, you've hid it, and it'll never come up again. Father, I love you for that. I love you for that. Father, I'll serve you the rest of my life for the things that you took away from me. Father, do that for my friends. And do that for my brothers and sisters. And do that for your people today. We pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said. Amen. Glad you came to church today.